And all right, good Friday afternoon, everyone. Uh, Chris here is a solutions director at 3Cloud Solutions, and he will be giving a seminar today about the services and solutions offered through 3Cloud. 3Cloud is a Microsoft partner and authorized consultant for the Microsoft Azure Cloud environment. OIT has worked with 3Cloud in getting researchers access, uh, access to their own customized cloud computing environment. This seminar is meant for those who would like to learn more about the robustness of cloud computing or are interested in utilizing cloud computing in general. Chris will be covering many topics, including, but not limited to, designing workflows, workloads in the cloud, uh, NVIDIA GPU acceleration for use in AI ML applications. Um, I think that basically covers it. Uh, well, Chris, I guess the floor is yours. Thank you, Randy. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I, I realized that I went a little backwards here, um, but a uh, quick intro. This is uh, Chris Bennett, um, one of our, uh, our solution directors here at 3Cloud covering research and healthcare infrastructure uh, with years of experience uh, in uh, applying uh, Azure-based technologies to research problems and high-performance computing in Azure. Um, quick, uh, quick overview of 3Cloud. We are a, a Microsoft partner that, that covers off on the entirety of the Azure platform. Uh, purely dedicated to uh, the Microsoft stack um, and have, uh, you know, a number of uh, your technical uh, capabilities underneath the hood. The, the big thing as it pertains to what we're going to be talking through today um, is we do have um, experience and expertise in, in both the high performance computing as well as the data state that, that accompanies that um, and, and quite a bit to kind of talk through. Um, so the big thing that, uh, you know, that we, we think about when we, what is research? Um, you know, in, in, the, in the case of, is uh, that you're, you're using tools, you've got, uh, you know, some existing workflows and processes that you're doing on-prem, you know, using compute in some way, um, and, and likely, you know, has, uh, has, has quite a bit of resources to go into jobs or, or has the potential to. Now, typically, uh, you know, these are, these are using, um, you know, regular uh, you know, industry standard tool sets across academia, uh, maybe you know potentially homegrown applications. Um, they're all they're all uh, applicable to Azure in some way. It just comes down to where is the what is the value proposition of applying cloud um, to the problem. Um, one of the the big things that we've got into available to us in Azure um, is is hyperscale uh, without needing to to have large expenditures of capital to buy um, expensive things on premises. Um, and then the other component is, you know, funding and grant opportunities. So, you know, uh, most universities are recipients of grant funding in some ways, either through industry or, or government programs. Um, and we have the ability to, um, to help augment um, and, and potentially even provide the capacity to go after more, um, considering uh, what, we, what we lay down in terms of research environments uh, become repeatable, meaning so we could scale out linear, linearly depending on the amount of labs um, and, and resources that are that are needed to, to accomplish them. Um, so the, the big thing uh, also is just the breadth of the platform. Um, you know, we've got, you know, all sorts of, of, of tooling available to us and different compute optimizations to deal with different types of, uh, of, of tool sets and, and workflows. Um, you know, just some examples of, of some of the things that we've dealt with. You know, we we can use you know NVIDIA back technologies to uh, to speed up uh, visualization processing of uh, of genomes uh, through through some of the genomics tooling. Microsoft actually has a uh, an entire uh, uh, section of the oops, looks like there was a timing on that uh, entire section of their HPC offering that's dedicated to genomics, where Microsoft actually curates. Uh, standard tooling around that, uh, which you know removes some of the administration overhead of using it, um, or uh, bringing in uh, some of the you know just components of, of other types of high performance computing environments, um, leveraging you know some of the the legacy schedulers that you're likely using on premises. Um, and the big thing is the security footprint that goes around all of this. Some of the challenges that we run into um, needing to solve for, especially in the evolving threat landscape that we've got. Um, is regulatory compliance and security, specifically for getting grant funding, maintaining grant funding, or, or going after additional grant funding um, that may require, uh, you know, having having security certification. Part of the the advantage of using Azure as a provider, actually, 
is that we're able to standardize around uh, the security footprint that Microsoft has built. Um, and the job becomes much easier to build out your regulatory compliant environments for your research and specifically for high performance computing. Um, it all kind of it all kind of boils down to you know the, the the same overall security footprint. And then uh, you know the the, the the there's hold on one second I have one in there. Um, there's there's several sort of advantages uh, to to adopting an Azure based HPC strategy. I mean flexibility is the big piece. Uh, obviously, uh, you know there's the there's a changing landscape in terms of the things that we're we're looking to be able to do. Whereas you typically buy hardware for on-premises workloads at a point in time, um, and things may change even throughout the course of a project as you figure out new ways to optimize and bring in new tooling and compute configurations um, to make things run more efficiently and cheaper. Uh, so Azure allows us to, to go through some of those design exercises um, around potential optimization, around you know, being able to uh, to bring in uh, you know uh, new tools to deal with parts of a process while maintaining you know existing components of of, of existing pipelines, um, and then the the big component is uh, the the ability to bring what you've already got. Uh, so uh, a lot of the tooling that you may be using on premises, specifically around open source HPC schedulers um, and and work that you've got built um, to leverage them. They're available in Azure. They're natively orchestrated through an Azure-based offering called Cycle Cloud, um, and it becomes a bridge to then be able to provide immediate um, value to you know reducing uh, runtime, reducing capacity uh, backlog, and, and bottleneck on-prem, uh, while you know being opening up the the ability to use some of the Azure-based platform services, specifically the the machine learning and, and AI uh, spaces that Microsoft has got. Um, which are platform-based services that, that all build off the same uh, sort of data layer and foundation that, that is laid for you and ready, ready to be used. Um, so getting into some of the, the specific tooling that's available. Um, first off, any tool is available to you if you bring it in a container or if you have it on infrastructure as a service, which would be a traditional you know, server that you've got on premises. Um, but there are uh, a number of additional services that Microsoft has available um, to you um, that may require, you know, slight refactoring of, of your processes, but, you know, represent an opportunity um, to potentially, uh, you know, reduce time to result um, and, and do new and interesting things uh, with modern tooling that's, that's, that's curated for you. Um, and that's, you know, more geared towards, you know, the, the machine learning and ML compute services, um, which you know, layer on top of the data state um, that is you know, dependent on your needs. Meaning, you know, we've got multi, we can we can deal with uh, you know super uh, super performant read heavy storage um, for running models, uh, and then you know pump results to something that's relatively cheap, and then archive for as long as we need to for even cheaper. Um, and kind of architect an all-up solution that allows you to do that and potentially collaborate data outside um, with, uh, with external uh, with external organizations. Uh, and then the, the compute itself and the orchestration of workloads is, is a fairly open-ended uh, stack um, that's got a couple different options depending on you know, what schedulers uh, are, are, are required and what services you need. The point there is uh, it's as much compute as you need optimized for the specific workload that you're running. There is a, a number of different compute configurations, not even getting into GPU or HPC optimization um, that can be brought to uh, to various job types, um, depending on what the, the outcome is and, and what performs best. Um, and we do have some optimization that can be done around that as well. Um, everything driving towards you know reducing costs as much as possible uh, to maximize the value of the platform. Um, and then one of the, the typical bottlenecks that, that researchers run into on premises is, you know, high-speed networking. Um, that becomes, uh, you know, trivial within the platform and, you know, something that there's a couple uh, high, uh, low latency, high speed uh, options for getting data in. Uh, so the data can be staged uh, and jobs run um, but once once in the platform, your bottleneck actually becomes storage uh, because you know the disk performance um, 
is variable, whereas the network performance is as fast as you're going to get. Um, between uh, uh, the, the compute and storage components. Um, now in the, the high performing storage, again, depending on you know, what sort of workloads are being run um, and what your requirements are, drives us to you know, traditional NFS and traditional file shares, scratch uh, type of configurations that you may be used to, um, as well as allowing us to bring in um, you know, really, really high performance caching technologies in an on-demand fashion meaning you know, we, we stand them up as part of a pipeline run, we, we cache our data, we run through really quick, and then we destroy everything. So you stop paying for it and transfer the data into something that's lower cost. Um, and we also have the ability um, to bring in uh, sort of uh, you know, uh, clustered data storage in, in, you know, in sort of traditional technologies you know, uh, uh, for, for actual you know, file systems, depending on performance needs as well. A lot of tuning that can be done uh, which again may represent an opportunity for um, making things run faster, getting results quicker, um, and ultimately helping costs optimize because time is money um, in Azure, um, as is uh, you know with with, uh, with most with most compute platforms. Um, and then there are the specific compute optimizations that have built been built in Azure for uh, for high performance computing. Um, the H series is the the HPC optimized. Uh, uh, compute foot, uh, footprints that have InfiniBand and and uh, you know everything that we need to to be able to uh, minimize and eliminate bottlenecks in jobs running as quickly as possible. Um, the N series represents uh, multiple NVIDIA chipsets um, that are dedicated to different functions, which we'll review in a bit more detail later. Um, but uh, all of these are you know on demand, so depending on you know what the uh, what the requirements are um, in terms of turnaround time. Um, there is also the ability to potentially use these things in a low priority fashion, uh, meaning you pay uh, less than uh, less than what's uh, what's what's uh, uh, marketed as commercial um, to be able to to use these things uh, when available, but you have to wait. Um, uh, in the event that uh, somebody else takes priority, um, but that is a very useful tool to be used uh, to use for um, development purposes um, and being able to actually migrate workloads into the platform. Um, so we'll move into you know what does optimized compute look like, um, and this is you know kind of why we're here, right? Because we've got. Um, uh, you know, a platform available to us uh, that either potentially has things that you can't uh, uh, have either ready, ready access to on premises or has a capacity for compute um, that exceeds on premises. Um, or even in some cases, uh, what, we've, what we've dealt with is, you know, you've got on premises compute, you've got existing clusters and existing process, but you want to add another stage. You want to add you know, some, um, some secondary analysis or, or, or something downstream from your existing pipelines where we are able to add in you know, specialized compute to you know, existing workloads, for example, um, you know, adding, a, adding a compute queue to a Slurm cluster that you can call after all of your jobs are done for, for uh, analysis and have that automatically burst from on-premises so that you don't have to refactor any of your code other than you know, submission to, to a different queue downstream in your pipeline. Um, this uh, becomes something that's uh, that we've got sort of an open end uh, of, of design that we can do in terms of how we piece things together in, in multi-stage pipelines um, and multi-stage workloads um, that could use all of these things. So there's uh, that also becomes uh, something that is, is difficult to replicate on-prem where, you know, you can dedicate a you know, high, uh, a high, uh, high compute optimized, uh, very high clock speed um, compute node to, to doing initial processing, then load everything into memory and then do whatever you need to do there um, and then do asynchronous processing through a, uh, an NVIDIA backed uh, uh, chipset and do all of that within one platform and only pay for each piece of it while it's running. So that's, uh, that's the, the underlying theme of everything that we're talking about in terms of compute um, is you get as much power as you need. There is a cost associated with it. Um, so we, we attempt to limit the amount of runtime that everything's got, um, which is where the, the actual HPC services that we'll get into in Azure um, orchestrate that for us. So it really becomes, you know, what's your tool set? 
Um, how does it perform best in terms of the underlying compute that's going to be required? Uh, how much data do you have and how long do you have to store it? And that fits into, you know, one of a couple boxes in terms of the HPC providers. Um, and then, you know, anything from, a, from an AI and ML perspective, um, there is the Microsoft tooling available that's able to leverage these same backend machines. Uh, so just slightly different cluster configurations with different tools, but again, um, all leveraging uh, some of the, uh, uh, the, the very high performance um, and, and scale of, of, uh, of processing power um, that we've got in Azure. Um, to get into some of the specifics and, you know, everybody will get a copy of the, the, the presentation via PDF. So if there's anything, you know, specifically that you'd like to get into, um, these are also all the, the values are also available online um, on Microsoft's documentation. Um, point to walking through some of the, you know, HPC uh, optimized uh, 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 SKUs that we've got is we've got substantial performance um, and, and the ability to bring, you know, high power machines to, to reducing time to results on, on existing processes um, by potentially just throwing, uh, you know, better performing hardware at it and getting things to run quicker. Uh, what these also represent is, uh, is an opportunity to, to rethink how we are um, staging and, and running our pipelines uh, because we do have, uh, you know, the ability to, um, to, to intermingle um, high performance machines only where needed for steps where are needed um, and dealing with things that are, that are, you know, much cheaper in nature, um, which can, you know, again, bring sort of uh, uh, a different value proposition to, uh, to being able to, to process things um, and, and, and get results quicker. Uh, depending on how you're optimized and how you build, uh, you know, again, there, there is AMD and Intel uh, you know, frameworks available, um, which gives you uh, quite a few options. Uh, AMD, you know, typically being a bit cheaper, um, but we have the, the high clock speeds of the, the AMD chipsets that are up there. Um, just getting into you know, some of the, the 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 V's as far as user concerns, you know, V1, uh, V2, V3, um, as they as they increase, um, you know, as does uh, they are they are the new leading edge uh, sort of newest chipsets. Um, so Microsoft stays on the 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 front end of of pushing those downstream. Um, so we're continuously getting uh, the the industry best performance that we can out of uh, the HPC optimized machines as they come in. And then the, the big thing uh, around uh, GPU-based computing, uh, you know, obviously we've got uh, several different chipsets in Azure um, that are optimized for different things. We've got the, the NV series of which there's some sub variants that have, you know, varying degrees of performance and, and, and tool sets available um, that are visualization optimized. Uh, the NC is, is for async asynchronous compute. Um, which is uh, different, different ASIC with different optimizations with some sub variants as well um, that include allowing us uh, to bring uh, and use uh, Illumina Dragon um, if there is any sort of uh, genomics processing that's going on internally. Uh, and then the, the ND series, uh, newer uh, sort of uh, uh, NVIDIA ASIC optimized for, for deep learning and AI. Uh, and the only thing that's required to be able to use these things is making sure that we've got capacity within the subscription um, and then, you know, it's uh, it, at that point we are we are able to um, provision some, um, depending on how many you need and what what what, uh, what capacity and forecast looks like. Um, you know, we have the ability to provide them. Uh, may not be the uh, something that uh, is is even available on premises, or you know, maybe may only be something you need for a few hours a, a month, or maybe just to run a few jobs and then you're done. Um, so these things are all available. Um, on an hourly basis, and when we build them into clusters, they get scheduled like any other machine does, um, and destroyed um, after the the run is complete. So you stop paying for them. And into some of the the specific types uh, of GPUs that are available, um, you know, we've got uh, uh, the the different chipsets for each variant of the underlying family. Um, that have uh, targeted optimizations for visualization, asynchronous code processing, um, and AI and ML um, with different GPU options. Uh, Microsoft has added ATI, ATI uh, Radeon uh, to, the, to the mix as well, 
uh, which has a bit, a bit of a different price point. Um, but there, there's several options. And again, all of these can be used, um, you know, in, in conjunction, um, depending on what optim or what uh, lands uh, for uh, each workload and, and sort of the best, uh, best area from an optimization standpoint. Um, and these are also, again, because they are hourly, uh, meaning on demand, um, does represent an opportunity to do some development and do testing. And what we wind up doing when we when we go to apply, you know, Azure uh, Azure base SKUs to to what were previously on premises based compute, compute footprints, um, is we do testing and optimization because we can take you know things that may take seven days to run on prem from a pipeline perspective that are multi stage and very compute intensive, and bring in you know super high uh, power. Uh, Machines that have got really high throughput in terms of compute that, that and uh, and crunch through what we need to on that, then move things into memory and then do you know the the processing that we need to um, you know in in ways that make sense from a from a workflow perspective uh, where we're matching technology to our steps versus trying to match our steps to technology that's available to us on prem uh, changes the paradigm a little bit um, when we've got a you know kind of an open tool set to be able to be using. Uh, and then the the ND visualization, or excuse me, deep learning series, uh, you know, follows the the same type of uh, same type of flow. Um, in that, you know, we have uh, different families that are set up with with uh, very different compute configurations um, that are meant for different job types um, and have uh, very very low latency in terms of the interoperability with disk. Uh, so. Uh, we can uh, remove bottlenecks um, that would exist elsewhere uh, and do it in an on-demand fashion. Now, along with high-performance computing is making sure that we've got the storage to be able to ensure that we don't have um, any bottlenecks in terms of performance uh, and that we can get things run through quickly, um, but also do it in a cost-effective way because uh, 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 storage, just like compute, um, you you pay for it on an on a on a usage basis um and more expensive or excuse me more performance storage is more expensive uh, on an ongoing basis so we want to minimize the usage um and then move things into uh you know lower cost storage uh, from from a uh, and uh from a performance perspective uh so what this allows us to do um is is intermingle and mix in different technologies um, and use different technologies at different job stages. Uh, so you know, input and and data transfer um, and the actual job run itself, we want to be, you know, as as quick as we can. Uh, maybe we don't care about the data transfer in, and we can stage all of our data in Azure and then run our you know run through our our labs and and whatever uh, you know use cases that we've got over time. Um, and then as we process that, it goes into results, which is, you know, a bit uh, slower in terms of, of, uh, of speed because we don't need to be, you know, running large compute off of it. There's, there's a number of ways to, to, to intermingle this. Uh, the, the point of this is we've got the ability to bring the storage uh, technology to the performance need and, and balance that with cost. Um, and then ultimately, because, you know, we do wind up carrying uh, uh, archival requirements as part of projects, and then uh, you know whatever's required for uh, for PI review to get data out of the environment. Um, there's there's several sort of uh, collaboration and and you know centralized archival options that are there. Um, the big thing is you know is if data is going to stay in Azure, um, archive is cheap, uh, gives you a lot, gives you a lot of data that you can store, um, as well as the ability to, to scrub it um, and know that it's gone uh, for in terms of compliance. Um, this will be more of a, a leave behind, uh, pretty pretty busy eye chart. But uh, but basically, the the point here uh, that we're trying to get across is depending on your performance and and how you need to use it, you have several options um, that increase in cost as you go down the chart. Um, so you know if we do truly have uh, you know actual parallel file system requirements and require really really high I/O, um, which is typically uh, used for in only um, some edge cases versus you know job, uh, some of the the larger uh, HPC workloads that we've got available to us. That's where we get into BGFS and and you know, Cray and and some of the the the, the really high speed um, high cost options. Uh, typically, we're playing in the in the file NAS space. Um, blob storage uh, is uh, super cheap and available through 
um, storage accounts, and we can use um, some tooling on top of this to make it appear natively. Um, but you know, for for actual uh, mix of mix of performance um, temporarily uh, for job runs, we typically run here. Um, but this also becomes something that is uh, is based off of your use case and what you need. Um, and all of these things could be intermingled again based off of stages. Um, that are that are run through uh, whatever pipelines need to be run, um, and then all of the SS or all of the VMs in Azure have an ephemeral SSD uh, that's attached to it uh, based on the SKU. It's a certain size, um, so we try to leverage that where at all possible because you're already paying for it. Um, that typically becomes our scratch, um, and uh, you know may be enough uh, for everything that you need to use. Uh, uh, more more often than not, because they can be pretty large, um, and they're offloading to Blob um, after after uh, jobs are run through. So uh, several options here uh, again, depending on what the 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 job requirements dictate, um, and and costs again being being a factor. Uh, the big thing with all of this uh, in terms of the high performance storage, um, minus uh, the the managed. Uh, managed platform, anything that's orchestrated can be built on demand via code, can then have data transferred into it, and then could have the uh, the data mounted into a, uh, a cluster jobs run, uh, results exited, and then the entire thing torn down, uh, which means that you pay for all of the performance you need um, during the time that you need it, and then that bill stops and you are just paying for your results or bringing that out of Azure and then that bill stops, period. Um, there's work to get there in terms of identifying you know, what the architecture is that supports that and, and then building the pieces. Um, but that's ultimately where we wanna land is providing you know, on-demand compute to you when you need it for as long as you need to run your jobs um, and then minimizing, minimizing our costs by getting rid of everything that we don't need once the job is done. And uh, now we're going to dive into how do we actually apply the long-winded uh, uh, sort of explanation of, of what the compute looks like and, and how all of that kind of uh, pulls together. Um, but uh, I, I guess I can, I can pause real quick uh, if there's if there's any questions, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the, that anybody has on you know either the computer storage footprints in Azure or the tooling that's available to us uh, before I talk about how we would apply that to your use cases. Um, I've got a question. Yes. Um, so are we allowed to pick and choose where we spin up our environments? I know you guys are in the cloud, but you obviously have data centers scattered where throughout the US or? Globally. Globally. Okay. But are we allowed yeah. to pick and choose, you know, someplace <laughs> local um, or I guess so, closest to us? Or does that just depend on where the hardware is at the time? It depends where you are. So we've actually had this conversation um, when I was on on site in Tuscaloosa a couple of years back, um, and you are smack dab in the middle of making a decision to be in East or Central, um, but the actual physical fiber lay um, between Tuscaloosa it peers through Georgia uh, for your I two connection, uh, which is I two is Internet two. That's the provider of you know access uh, ultimately to the high speed peering to Azure for you. Um, so you'd probably want to land in East, but at the same time, once you traverse that that path, right? So you go from on, on campus to uh, Azure through that peering, um, it's all dark fiber between Azure regions. So some cases we go where the hardware is. Uh, so especially some of these specialized chipsets, they may not be in East, although most are. Uh, they may be in South Central. Um, so uh, we tend to uh, go where, where is required. Um, and then anything outside of the continental US, uh, you know, gets into the security requirements around the workloads that you're working on. Um, it is technically feasible, but it becomes uh, something that gets a bit more complicated. Thanks, Chris. But when we are transferring our data um, into Azure to then do things with it, um, and we don't have a hard time requirement on how long it's going to take for the transfer, you can effectively choose any region that you'd like to. Um, it would just, you know, it should make sense that you're choosing it. 
uh, which is why, you know, if, if, it, it, if that becomes a, an availability of resources um, and you guys have most of them available to you in East US, which is your closest region, which is where your Azure is built in. Thanks. All right, uh, I do have uh, time um, at the end uh, for, for questions. I just wanted to take a brief pause because uh, I did sprint through <laughs> quite a bit of content there. Um, anything else before I move on to how we apply everything that we've talked about um, into a solution? All right. Um, so as mentioned, uh, you know, we, we do have uh, the ability to use uh, any tooling that's available as long as it's either in a container or installable on a Linux or Windows instance um, and use multiple types of data. Um, the first step in this um, is, is typically um, setting up something hybrid. So, you know, whether we're using, you know, Slurm, Grid Engine, or, or any of the, you know, open source schedulers that have a, an integration with Azure, um, the vast majority of them have an ability to actually uh, seamlessly burst. And seamlessly is to you, meaning um, we can attach your, um, we can attach to your uh, high performance computing environment on premises and provide excess capacity in Azure. Meaning, you know, if you are waiting um, in queue and, and there are not resources available to run your jobs, we have the ability to have that spin up those same resources here in Azure um, using a headless scheduler for the scheduler uh, uh, that you're using. So this works for um, uh, some of them easier than others, but the point that we would be doing is, is moving, uh, copying data out to Azure, uh, spinning up compute, running the jobs, and then pumping the results back on premises. Um, what this means to the researchers um, is you've got your on-premises scheduler, you've got your on-premises data, and you've got your on-premises pipelines. Um, you don't need to change anything. You just need to have this built uh, into the capacity or the, the actual queue of your on-premises HPC scheduler. Um, and you know, once capacity fills up here, excess capacity filters over here. Um, and and you get uh, you know things potentially moving uh, a bit quicker because you've got uh, comp uh, extra compute when you need it. Um, this is also something that kind of applies when you know we want to bring Nvidia to the party, uh, where you know we've got existing pipelines on premises, we've got existing processes, and you know again we've got we want to add a stage to a job, or we want to have you know a job complete give us results, and then we want to do something else with it. Um, we could we could have you know, for example, a Slurm queue within your existing Slurm environment that is specifically for NVIDIA and the SKUs that you need um, and the tools that you need to run in them um, and then have that burst out. The, the caveats doing this is the data that you consume here has to be the same as the data you consume here on premises. Um, but other than that, um, you, you can uh, your tool sets, um, as long as they're licensed appropriately, um, um, are portable um, at that point. Uh, this allows us again to, to kind of step into an existing process with, with little to no refactoring. Um, again, unless you wanted to use a net new queue that's available to you um, of your existing jobs um, and, and add um, something to it. Now, this becomes uh, uh, again an environment that has some customization to it. Uh, all of the, the compute components that are running here. Um, we get to choose their sizing, we get to choose their underlying compute configuration. So you've got some options on optimization. Um, but if this is the, the starting point, uh, you, your ultimate goal um, would hopefully be to, uh, to be able to optimize uh, in, in the cloud, meaning um, get an idea of what your, your runtime looks like for your jobs here. Uh, in terms of cost, um, and then basically, if we can remove the latency for having to use on-premises data and copy, you know, we have the potential to make things a bit quicker, um, which gets us into you know how we approach the HPC uh, challenge natively. Meaning, we've removed the on-prem um, clusters, and and really, what we're dealing with at this point is moving data into a stage location. Um, and then building a, an optimized cluster around the processing of whatever the workflow you have is. So we, we bring data in, 
We choose what our storage technology is going to be based off a couple factors. One of them is performance. Um, and another is, you know, do we need to maintain metadata for, for, uh, for, for subsequent uh, stages of the pipeline? Um, what are, how, do we, how are we going to deal with results? Uh, where do they need to be? What's our process for getting them out? Is there collaboration? Is there anything um, that's going to be dealt with in terms of secondary processing from you know, each stage of a pipeline? Are there multiple tools involved in terms of schedulers? Uh, this is where you know, if, you've, if you've built something for Slurm or Grid Engine on-prem, you could use this with minor refactoring to the code that you've got. It's still using Slurm or Grid Engine in Azure. The storage is just different. So there's, there's, there's our delta um, for, for being able to use it. Um, and once we are in this environment, we do have the ability to bring in, um, you know, high speed caching and, and things that, you know, can, can help us lower our time to results um, for the workloads that are being run. Um, this is a fairly open ended platform, meaning CycleCloud will orchestrate um, any HPC provider you want to customize and bring an image to it. Um, or it's got, you know, built in ones that are sort of the uh, you know the the standard uh, the standards within academia um, for for our, uh, for for scheduling that are open source. So that's you know Grid Engine, that's uh, Slurm. There's uh, IBM's in there. They've got um, HPC Pack and uh, PBS and and a, and a couple others um, that that are available. Um, you know to, that are that are curated through CycleCloud, meaning that uh, the packages are all taken care of and all of the the administration around getting that piece to work um, is done for you. It's about bringing your tools um, and your data, um, and then piecing together, you know, what you need to do from an optimization standpoint, based off of, you know, the ability to move, uh, you know, move buttons in this place, uh, in this space, in terms of storage and and the actual compute cluster itself. Um, now, once we have this, uh, you know, we've got the ability, uh, obviously, to to optimize stages, which we also have the ability to do. Uh, to be portable if we are going to bring in containers um, or if we are uh, if you are already looking at doing you know any sort of biomedical research or genomics uh, where Microsoft has containers for you which is the uh, the the second offering in, in the HPC space uh, outside of our traditional HPC schedulers um, is Cromwell uh, which uh, is the you know the Microsoft uh, uh, genomics platform, um, and Microsoft curates the uh, containers and tool sets that are uh, industry standard around that for you, um, so you don't need to. Uh, and the big thing here uh, is it's a uh, because they are uh, doing that um, and the all of the components uh, within this um, minus the actual the Cromwell instance itself for all platform services. Um, there's very little administration around this. Um, it's it's really just you know bring your data, run your job, get your results, um, and build out an environment uh, per lab. Uh, there's there's multiple ways to kind of piece this together, um, but uh, but it's uh, fairly flexible in terms of the ongoing usage, uh, and that's the big thing with any of these solutions is the admission the administration layer. Um, gets handled for you. In this case, uh, Cromwell has uh, platform services. In the case of you know, uh, CycleCloud, your, your environment is, is orchestrated for you based off the specifications you bring to it with your tools. Uh, and then you know, how that actually shakes out in terms of you know, managing it, um, that's where we get into uh, how do we how do we orchestrate um, and you know, just uh, get some of the, the schedulers that are that are built into Cycle Cloud that are just a matter of us hooking up and using um, that don't require you to refactor your code if you are using these um, if you are not uh, we do have a limited ability to bring in just about anything that you're using if we want to build something custom um, obviously much easier and much more straightforward if you're using one of these. Um, I've oh, got a case study for you to, to read through. Um, basically, you know, going through that the, the full process of standing up hybrid, standing up bursting, getting into building native clusters, and then in this case, uh, bringing Microsoft Genomics tooling to be able to accelerate uh, time to result for a cancer center um, that's uh, helping uh, enable getting uh, national certification 
um, in the uh, the National Cancer Institute. Uh, but the the big thing, how do we use this? Uh, we uh, the, there's there's a, a number of moving pieces to the solutions that we've talked about. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, we wind up building an architecture. And that architecture gets some sort of security sign off, so the components of it are going to meet the security. Uh, 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 requirements for the, the workloads that you've got. Um, and then it comes down to, we have an architecture, we have a number of use cases that would apply to it. And we have minor changes, customizations within that architecture that, that make it, you know, optimal for your pipelines and workloads. Um, that can go into an orchestration engine, uh, which is automation based um, and have a catalog of items um, to be able to deploy um, and repositories for those architectures that get built for you um, that, that, uh, that layer onto you know, a place to land them in Azure. Um, how this kind of looks is we have uh, a, a front end. This is where uh, researchers would interact with uh, what is available to you, either based off of, you know, what was custom built for you, or, you know, there is a scenario where the university could build out um, some standard offerings that you provide to all researchers that you could uh, be given access to through uh, some front end means. Uh, we've done this through Teams, we've done this through, you know, web apps, uh, there's, there's several ways to kind of uh, to approach that. Uh, but that flows through a, a process to then orchestrate it and build it for you on the back end. So everything that we just kind of reviewed in terms of how we apply all of the, uh, the compute footprints that we can build, uh, we do that into one of the architectures that we looked at that can get orchestrated through um, and all of the pieces and components of the build chosen on the front end through an automation platform into a DevOps pipeline to then do the build, do all the configuration, set everything up, including all the cost reporting, and then there you go. Here's your environment to interact with um, for the duration of your project. Um, and when we do that, and when we're deploying out, you know, an architecture that's gone through an actual review of the the components, we also have a cost um, and and have the ability to to track that cost. So that becomes a a big component of, of using, uh, you know, a cloud provider is, you know, when everything is available to you on demand, uh, you want to make sure that, that you're using it responsibly and effectively. Um, so that's uh, uh, kind of all built into uh, the orchestration platform that we call the healthcare engine for research orchestration portal. Um, although in this case, uh, you know, there's a broader application beyond just healthcare. Um, but the, the point is to be able to take um, complex architectures and uh, with with lots of moving pieces that help you meet your research needs and simplify them down to um, a, a usable end user experience that gets us there and gets that deployed the right way. Um, that's also met all of our security requirements. Um, can absolutely dive into um, you know uh, deep dive any of the pieces here, um, but uh, that's. Uh, uh, what we wanted to review in terms of what we can do from a high performance computing and Azure perspective uh, and uh, you know kind of what your what your high level options are in terms of a couple architectures that we've deployed all over the country uh, to help empower researchers uh, to be able to do more quicker. Um, so I've got the, the, the rest of the time available to us um, to answer any questions that anybody may have um, could dive into any use cases you'd like to, to discuss um, also have uh, you know, willing and able to to follow up offline um, after this is uh, after this is done, and you know people have been able to review um, to talk about any use cases you may have um, at the macro or micro level. Thanks, Chris. The floor is open to any questions. Feel free to unmute yourself or type in chat. I've got a quick question for you, Chris. Um, for the case study, you t you brought up like a healthcare example. So I'm assuming that you probably followed, you know, cybersecurity standards like HIPAA. So do you also do the, does your cloud environments also support other IT security standards or? It does. So the, the example that we outlined was HIPAA uh, and NIST. Um, okay. And it was an, it was an academic medical center. So it was for both the research computing for the university and the, the AMC component of it. 
um, as far as what we can cover. Uh, so we cover up to, uh, you know, NIST 800-171 and, and, and anything that does not require U.S.-based persons in the commercial cloud. Uh, so that is, you know, just standard Azure, everything that we reviewed. Um, if you do get into um, FedRAMP um, and ITAR export control requirements and anything uh, within, you know, that that space, that goes over to GovCloud, um, which is also, you know, under the Microsoft umbrella. Um, and it's, uh, it's treated uh, a bit differently, um, way more restrictive in terms of, um, the the requirements to to land workloads there, um, although you do have that capability um, that is available to you to scale into should should more uh, workloads come up. Um, that is uh, a current effort, um, and then the the final piece of the puzzle there is if you have anything associated with the National Institute of Health um, and any NIH NIH grant research. There is the Microsoft Strides partnership, which is the Microsoft and National Institute of Health tenant um, that you can put in some paperwork to get access to, um, which allows you to do your NIH grant funded research in Azure technologies in that tenant at a discount. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Um, I have one question. So, um, if you uh, do you guys like provide certain kind of uh, help in terms of coding and all stuff, whether like you know researchers made a mistake, uh, they are they ordered a high resource but they could not use their code could not use. So you analyze that and catch the error and help that way or not. Yes, we do. Um, so pipeline optimization and being able to use the full power of these high powered uh, machines we've got available to us um, is a uh, is is a big area of opportunity um, to be able to to make sure that um, everything can run efficiently. So we do uh, do help with we do help with that. Um, it's a depending on you know, what it's written in um, and and what you're doing. You know, it lands with one of a couple teams. We do have a a uh, large custom app dev practice internally. Um, and we do have people that are that are skilled in uh, you know the AI and ML pipelines as well. Okay. And um, does the service for UA students is it um, is it free or how much cost for the students to get in? Um, So um, I don't know specifically what your students have access to, but if they did have, um, there's the there's the student use benefit around Azure, which has um, some level of spend to it, um, and then there are I've I've seen elsewhere in the country, um, you know, student uh, able uh, uh, Visual Studio licensing, which gives um, some ability. Uh, to uh, give students a, a space to be able to consume Azure um, with a monthly spend threshold to be able to do some of these things. Um, it's going to be a matter of, uh, you know, what needs to be run, right? Because as we, if we're talking about you're know, running pipelines that require large amounts of compute, well, one of those environments isn't going to go very far. Um, but for learning purposes, um, that has been something that's been effective. Uh, as far as being able to allow students to do code development um, and to be able to build pipelines, um, get, uh, you know, uh, test the feasibility, um, and then bring that to a, a real production scenario. So, yeah, there is uh, two scenarios here, like some, uh, you know, course that offer uh, cloud, let's say cloud computing, uh, and that bunch of students, like hundreds of students do, uh, just give some kind of credit to them or it's uh, just free for UA students that time or some, uh, you know, PhD students uh, have research doing it. So how that cost affects, um, that's basically to think. 
Yeah, there's a there's a few ways to solve that, and then we could definitely have a collaborative conversation with your with your Microsoft team. Um, what I've seen in the Northeast, uh, where I'm where I'm at, um, is is basically standing up an, an area within Azure specifically for um, you know student uh, and and teaching, um, and 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 basically having a you know a, a learning tenant, um, and then having the ability for students to get into that. Um, and then doing all of that under what's called a dev test SKU, which means that there is a lower cost to the Azure resources that are running. Um, and then the students each have their own sort of sandbox that, that they can do their development in um, and fully utilize Azure. Very useful for, you know, masters and graduate level um, uh, folks to get experience in the platform and actually be able to leverage and utilize some of the modern tooling. Um, and definitely something we can have a a uh, conversation about how that looks um, and that would all go through, you know, your, your Microsoft relationship and, and the Microsoft team. Um, but I could definitely help uh, speak to um, how that's been done elsewhere um, and, and what that specifically looks like. Okay, cool. And we'll take that as a follow on item. So I think it's uh, definitely a worthwhile conversation. Any other questions that we've got for this afternoon? Um, and again, uh, if there are any 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 questions that uh, that anybody's got um, that uh, you know we want to to take to email, um, I did provide uh, my my contact information further up in the deck. I'm happy to uh, to answer any any emails that that anybody has question wise. Um, also, uh, you know, LinkedIn as well if uh, if that's a preferred method of communication, um, and. Uh, We've got uh, Dennis Rudd, uh, who is uh, Dr. Dennis, uh, who is our uh, our sales uh, executive that is covering uh, education for uh, the East. Um, that we so we've got multiple points of contact that we can be uh, be able to uh, to answer any questions you may have, um, as well as provide some uh, you know, some additional uh, scenarios uh, of different research uh, configurations depending on what you're interested in. Um, and one thing I do want to make sure everybody's aware of um, through your Microsoft partnership. Uh, is we do have the ability to help uh, sort of align um, uh, grant writing um, and being able to to bring uh, bring some of that expertise to, to be able to actually uh, make sure that Azure can be consumed in grants that you are getting to enable the uses of the tools that we described. I had a hardware question. Um, yes. You, uh, you were talking about um, some of your platforms like the ND series and I saw that most of them seem to be built around the V100, um, V100, V1000, no, V1, VT100, um, which uh, that's a um, that's an NVIDIA GPU um, that uh, uses Tesla architecture. Is that right? Yeah, there's uh, there's several different options um, for the actual underlying NVIDIA architecture. Um, depending on the, the family you need and what optimization you need. That is one of them, though, yes. The, the, reason, for the, question, the reason for the question is that I don't remember the exact order of the NVIDIA architectures, but, but um, Tesla is, is a while back, and there's a new one called uh, Ampere. Uh, does that have any advantages, or um, is it just that your hardware is, is, is uh, is on uh, 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 the Tesla architecture. Um, so there's 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 two answer there's two pieces to the answer. One of them is uh, they have uh, the the newest Nvidia's are there um, and available uh, just in specific regions, um, and there are certain for for depending on the service that you're using so you know there, there's the SKUs generally available as a compute footprint with a driver integration um, to do what you want with it the ones that have been geared towards you know ai ml for example um, have some optimizations built in through the platform service that is those tool sets um, so there's some there, there's some advantage there uh, if you're going to use the the the, the built the built in platforms uh, tooling um, other than that, you know, it's, uh, it's resource availability with the driver that you need for the chipset that you choose and the tools that you want to bring to it. Thank you. 
Hopefully that answered the question. You're welcome. All right. All right. Um, well, and, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, Randy. Oh, I was just gonna say, uh, any any other anything else that we can answer with the uh, final couple of minutes here um, for anybody on the team? All right, I'd like to add that the uh, session is recorded and the slides will be available. Um, you could reach out to Chris anytime um, or myself. Um, and yeah. Thanks for swinging by. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate your time and attention this afternoon. Everybody have a great weekend. Thank you.